Paul is part of ProSocial, which he's going to talk about. And the structure of the talk will be that first he presents ProSocial because we assume less familiarity with ProSocial here than with sociocracy. And then I'm going to compare the two a little bit. Oh, we're going to do that together and then there will be time for questions. So really the way we've been looking at it, just for you to have like a mental frame to, to put what you're going to hear into, I see ProSocial as something like the, the framework that sociocracy clicks into. It's basically a bigger umbrella that uh, sociocracy clicks into and that makes the whole thing really exciting. I remember when I first heard about uh, ProSocial and what it says and um, the uh, core design principles, I thought, wow, that's basically exactly what we're saying, just a little bit more universally. So it's very exciting to me to have this connection because it opens up a whole different universe um, where we can find each other. Well, first of all, Ted, I just, such a delightful intro and Thank you all in, in the sociocracy community for having me here. Um, um, I, I agree that uh, there's a sort of generosity of spirit on um, and the possibility of sharing here, which um, I'm very excited about and I'm looking forward to learning more from all of you um, during this conference. So um, I, I'll dive straight in because I'd love it if we had some time for Q&A and uh, we will leave time for that. As Ted mentioned, I guess I'm here to explain ProSocial because uh, most of you wouldn't have probably never heard of it before. Um, I see it as four things, a perspective, a research effort, a research agenda that we're really solidly trying to explore whether our um, interventions and methods and um, perspectives are having an effect. Uh, and a community of practice. We have over 350 trained facilitators now and um, we're growing that all the time. There's a lot of interest <clears throat> and a practical process. But I'm not really going to talk about the research effort in the community of practice here because I really want to keep it tight for just focusing on what it is as a perspective and as a process that you can use. So as a perspective, I like to think of it as the base of ProSocial is founded in some ideas of evolutionary theory. And then we basically, the pillars, if you like, um, are constructed of behavioral science and social science. And what we're trying to construct is a, is a, is a new view of human nature, a more positive view of human nature than what has been promulgated by economics and, and much of the social sciences. So the, the first big idea is the idea from evolutionary theory of multi-level selection. And one of the founders of ProSocial is a guy called David Sloan Wilson, who's kind of famous for pushing this idea. Um, evolutionary theory is kind of different these days from what is in the popular notion. Um, we're talking about evolution, as, you, as you're probably aware, everything is evolving all the time in multiple streams, genetic, epigenetic, behaviours are evolving, cultures are evolving, um, our symbolic stream of language is evolving. And the key part of the notion of multi-level selection is that this is happening at multiple levels, naturally enough. Um, cells, organs, individuals, groups, and culture. So traditional views of, of evolution have sort of focused on red in tooth and claw and survival of the fittest individual, if you like. But that perspective is really only partial and ignores the evolutionary value of cooperation and the fact that cooperation um, is often a more successful strategy in nature. If you want to sum up what multi-level selection is all about, you can sum it up in kind of one uh, little phrase, which is sometimes selfishness can beat altruism within groups. People can profit for themselves. Um, they can free ride, they can exploit others within groups. But if once the uh, level of selection is raised to the level of groups, altruistic groups tend to be more successful. They tend to spread their practices more than selfish groups. And this is thought to be one of the reasons why altruism um, may have evolved so strongly within humans. We're essentially a, a small tribal species. 
evolution's unfolding at um, at, at 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 all of these levels. And so, where we end up with, in you know, there's a lot to this piece, but in a very short space of time, I just want to flag that evolutionary theory brings us this lens, if you like, for looking at um, thinking about work in groups. How can we create contexts that select for people to behave out of collective interest rather than self-interest is one way of sort of viewing, if you like, what evolutionary theory is um, bringing to us. And I wanted to illustrate the idea of multi-level selection or it's sometimes called group selection um, with a somewhat amusing example, but it's also a real example from a paper in 2010 by Bill Muir and his colleagues. Um, I'll just set the context up. Imagine you've got a situation where you've got chickens in cages of six. Um, each generation, the, the, you, there's two different selection criteria. One is you select the best cages, the most productive cages, that is the ones, the cage that lays the, the most eggs. Um, and um, the other selection, oh, sorry, I'm just tracking the, um, the, the chat line, which is always a mistake. Um, the other selection criteria is you choose the best individual chickens for breeding. Whenever I think of this, I always think of a typical university <laughs> department. You know, do you choose the groups that get along or do you pick the people with the most publications <laughs> to get promoted, right? So I think this is pretty much uh, a direct analog of a typical university department. Breed for six generations, what happens? Which one produces the most eggs? Now bear in mind, and I, and I actually invite you to type in the chat line what you think might happen over six generations of choosing for the best group of chickens or the best individual chickens. They're, bear in mind the best individual chickens, they're picking the highest layers. So genetically and then breeding them, they should, you know, keep on producing more and more egg. Yeah, but of course you folks are also wonderfully communitarian that you're gonna be guessing something else, right? And unfortunately for the poor chickens in the individual layers condition, this is what actually happens. It's quite disturbing this picture I know and I acknowledge that, but on the other hand, it's kind of um, what you might expect. The, the way they choose for groups, um, they get along just fine and they keep on laying plenty of eggs and the eggs, there's more and more eggs over time. But if you choose the best individual chickens, they peck each other to death basically. <laughs> and you end up with a situation where you have just a few um, chickens remaining. This <laughs> I do really think that this uh, just reminds me so much of the typical workplace where people are chosen for individual performance. So that's big idea number one is the idea that um, basically we bring in a whole lot of perspectives from evolutionary theory, but we're particularly interested in the idea that everything is a group. I'm a group of competing emotions and thoughts and feelings. Well, I'm also a group of cells and organs and so forth. There is no things in the world, there's only groups and they're in a continuous unfolding complex adaptive system. Uh, and so the key is to try and identify how can we shift the selection pressures from favoring individuals to favoring the group level. The second big idea was in David Sloan Wilson, who I mentioned, met with Eleanor Ostrom, who's a Nobel Prize winner from 2009, um, for her work on economic governance and in particular on the commons. If you haven't, um, I can't really see that many people, so I can't ask, but uh, I'd be interested to know if any of you have heard of Eleanor Ostrom. Um, at the time, she was practically unknown within the field of economics, but uh, what she was doing was uh, essentially mounting an argument against a very strong idea within economics, which is the tragedy of the commons. You're no doubt familiar with this idea, but I'll just explain that it's the idea that human nature is such that um, if we leave people alone, they'll inevitably exploit resources and be greedy and uh, take so much that there won't be anything left for anybody, if you like. And this is a um, quote from one of Hardin's later papers where he actually recognized that he was not 
in the original paper, he just said the commons, but in a later paper, he uh, qualified that and said an unmanaged commons. Um, what Ostrom's work really realized, um, brought to attention in the world was that, um, in fact, there are many groups that uh, cooperate extraordinarily successfully over thousands of years sometimes, or certainly hundreds of years, if they're able to form agreements and those agreements have particular, embody particular um, design principles. And so when David worked with, um, David's one of our members of our team, pro-social world team, when he worked with Lynn Ostrom, uh, he was trying to generalize her principles to apply to all groups based on evolutionary theory. And this is basically the principles. Now, there won't be anything on here that uh, is new to anyone in sociocracy. I think sociocracy is a absolutely beautiful embodiment of many of these ideas. Um, uh, Ostrom focused on um, understanding group boundaries, which I know sociocracy pays a lot of attention to, who's in and who's out and who should be in. We talk about that in terms of shared identity and purpose is absolutely key. Equity, inclusive decision-making, which is one of the, this in particular is something that's really attracted me to sociocracy, um, is, uh, you know, there's the, the wonderful, Ted's wonderful book, um, uh, and, um, uh, the um, work that's being done on consent-based decision-making, which is just tremendous. We, so I think these are fairly perhaps self-explanatory. We, um, we need to have transparency. We need to be able to see what others are doing in the group. Otherwise self-interest can thrive. We need to have appropriate and graduated responding to, um, in particular, Ostrom was focused on unhelpful behaviours and sanctioning, but we've generalised that to also focus on, you know, reinforcement and celebrating success and so forth. Uh, fast and fair conflict resolution, capacity to self-govern, and the quality of having good relations with with other groups that embody these principles. So think of it, authority to self-govern is that a group really needs to have the authority to embed and, and, and express these first six principles um, and a uh, appropriate relations with other groups, what Ostrom called polycentric governance, is really the capacity to have these principles apply at the next level up. So groups of groups need to have shared identity and purpose. Groups of groups need to have equity between them and fair and inclusive decision-making. As you know, within um, when you look at the ways that circles relate to one another. So these ideas um, were then, we, what we've done is also, I'm a psychologist and we've combined these ideas um, through some work uh, developed by a gentleman called Steve Hayes and a, and a host of others uh, called Contextual Behavioural Science, which has an applied technology called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or Acceptance and Commitment Training, which essentially is a mindfulness-based therapy approach or mindfulness-based approach to behaviour change. And I was thinking about how can I sum it up in a few words, and I, I guess it's this core idea that the the world we create is a product of the quality of our consciousness, of our awareness that we bring to it, not just in perceiving it, but in um, constructing what's possible and in understanding that uh, the qualities of human nature is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like. Our sense making and our emotions can, um, our verbal abilities, our capacity to imagine the past and the future can create paradise or hell, depending on how we relate to our, our meaning making. Um, and so what we're trying to create in groups is this quality of what we call psychological flexibility, which is essentially the capacity to move in the direction of what really matters, even in the presence of, um, of difficult aversive experience. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a tool to sort of illustrate that a little bit later. And the key thing is that this psychological flexibility supports cooperation and performance. We've got plenty of evidence for that um, and it can be trained. So here are some key ideas that I've 
kind of mentioned. Um, if we want to improve um, uh, cooperation at scale, we need tools that work at multiple levels of cultural selection, individuals, groups, and groups of groups. Ostrom's, one of, another of Ostrom's key insights was small groups are a key neglected factor in organizing human effort that complement bottom-up markets and top-down regulation. And I know, of course, you all know this. I guess I'm simply saying it because of, to pick up on Ted's intuition that we're really singing from the same song sheet. <clears throat> and our quality of awareness matters. So that's all that a little bit of the theory that I'll show you, give you a book link at the end if you're interested in learning more about this. But I did want to move on to very briefly the practical process. Um, just doing a quick time check. Um, Ted, I seem to have, is we- We're 20 minutes in. So almost 20, so. Yeah. Good. Okay, great. Well, I've, I'll just carry on for another five minutes or so, I think. That's all right. <clears throat> um, so um, we, we also really wanted to make this a practical process, but we're not at the level of specificity that uh, sociocracy is at. We're nowhere near at that point, and we've got an awful lot to learn, as I've indicated. But we do have some tools that we think might be useful for within sociocracy, and perhaps Ted will speak to this. Uh, we have some tools uh, which essentially the, the acceptance and commitment training matrix tool that can be used as either an individual or a collective level the core design principles, uh, goal setting and experimentation, and a set of research tools. So typically when we engage with a group, we might explore what's going on in the group through the lens of the core design principles that I've already shown you. You know, how are we doing in terms of shared identity and purpose? How are we doing in terms of equity? How are we doing in terms of levels of transparency and so forth? <clears throat> and each of these things separately and cumulatively uh, related to group trust, group satisfaction and group commitment is some of the research that we've been doing. Um, we then might do say a collective matrix and I'll show you what this is in just a moment to establish, help establish shared identity and purpose. We might do the personal version of that to explore personal implications of say a change that we might be proposing for a group and then uh, explore other core design principles and set goals and pursue those goals. So we use this design principle framework as a, as a way of assessing groups, but also um, directing attention towards what needs to change. The ACT matrix is, and I, I wish I had time to show it to you in detail and lead you through it, but I just want to give you a taste of what it's a little bit about. Essentially, we're interested in <clears throat> two, and, and, and in a sense, this is how we teach psychological flexibility and how we talk about psychological flexibility as being recognizing two key dimensions of our experience that we bring to every moment, including right now. Um, that at any moment, we're always basically moving toward what matters, toward what gives us vitality or away from pain. In behavioral language, you can talk about positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Those two things can control our lives. And you'll know some people that are basically living from a space of vitality and meaning and other people that are living from a space of fear and trying to control risk and reduce pain in various different ways. Well, of course, all of us are constantly moving in that space and each experience is under the control of either the toward forces or the wave forces. At the same time also, we kind of move in two different worlds. We move in the world of physical contingencies of behaviors that have real impacts upon one another, but we also move in this constructed world of our inner thoughts and feelings, which can sometimes bear little relationship to what others see as going on. And so it's really, really helpful to work with people in this way to help them clarify is what you're doing now 
moving toward what matters or away? Is it coming out of love or fear? Is it, and also, is it stuff going on in your head or what's going on in the actual world of behavior for yourself or for others? So <clears throat> this has got a lot of text on it and I guess I'll draw your attention to this bit, perhaps just ignore this for now. Um, to give you an example of a, a technique we might use to get towards shared identity and purpose, we can ask typical you know, values-based questions that you would have encountered before, like this miracle question, um, to evoke values and goals for the group, but then move down here to talk about and what would that look like if we are actually embodying that in our behavior, what would we be doing? And as you know, I'm sure all of you know from the point of view of um, uh, facilitator, um, from the point of view of being a facilitator, helping people to make this discrimination <laughs> between the sense they're making and what they're actually doing can be enormously powerful to enhance cooperation. But I think what's really important about the matrix tool is that it gives space in groups for people to, um, to talk about uh, this left-hand side as well, um, and which is more the fears and concerns. I'm conscious of the time, and so I'm going to skip over talking about this any further. Just think about the matrix tool as being a way of evoking expression of both what people care about, but also we were talking just before in the talk before about psychological safety, also helping to create a psychologically safe space where people can talk about their fears and concerns, but in a way that's kind of as an observer. Um, this is, I guess, our aim. So yeah, I'm gonna wrap up there and hand over to Ted um, to talk a little bit about the overlaps with sociocracy. Thank you, Ted. So some of that will be a repeat and that's the point because it is all so different. And it, as, as um, Paul has said, I think it's very easy for us to understand each other because our thinking is so similar. So here I have basically three slides. One is how sociocracy complements sociocracy, uh, pro-social complements sociocracy, then reverse, and then just going through the design principles and saying a few things about uh, how sociocracy looks at it. So one thing that I'm aware of in how pro-social complements sociocracy is that there has been just so much more uh, researching or studying of, of case studies been done, then we have to show for in sociocracy. Um, so that's something to tap into that I, that I really like and also the, the design, uh, the research tools. So that's something I think where we can learn from the post-social community within sociocracy. Then I am, um, so the, the concept of multi-level selection, like the thing with the, the hands and breeding, breeding for um, individual um, success and for group success, that was a huge eye-opener. I think after reading about this one, I told probably 20 people about that very, very thing because it really it, it, um, enhanced my understanding of what it is that we're doing and why it just makes sense, just looking at groups and protecting working groups in sociocracy. We know that, right? It's not as a thing that, that, that we need to be told in the sociocratic community. And yet I think it's really good to have some more of a backdrop of that's why this makes sense. Protecting working groups is something that we have to put very high on, our, on, on what, we, what we value and cherish in sociocratic organizations. And then multi-level selection basically gives even more backdrop of why all this uh, makes sense. One big thing, and I'll say more about that in, in a little bit, is the um, alignment with mission. That's one of the core design principles, shared purpose. I'm gonna talk about that more when I go through the uh, design principles. And then, oh, sorry, there's one point here, and that is how sociocracy complements for social, and that is specificity, the how-to. So you've seen, and there are more tools, many more tools than Paul uh, talked to. So pro-social comes with its own techniques, and yet there are also some um, things that it asks for where I go, oh, just do it sociocratically, you know. For example, um, just running a meeting, um, you can just basically take sociocracy off the shelf, unplug it in there, and, and it does many of the things that pro-social is asking for. 
So that's, um, I think the way we talked about it in the preparation was sort of a um, big brother, little brother kind of relationship. <laughs> was that the, was that, was that the metaphor that we agreed on? <laughs> well, I, yeah, except I don't know who's the big brother and who's the little brother. <laughs> yeah. Sociocracy has been in the world a lot longer and is a lot more mature in some ways. Or a sister, mm. yes. Thank you, Maddie. Mm. <laughs> and sister. Sibling, how would we go for that? All right. <laughs> the, so let me, this is a repeat because these are the design principles and Paul started talking about them. But let's look at them really. And I actually even have a little like um, graph that I'm preparing, but this is just me throwing dots onto a map so don't you know, make up your own mind. But basically it's what I'm aiming to show is how does sociocracy already embody or come with that sort of in, in, in how we operate. So shared identity and purpose, have knowing your aim and knowing your mission we all know that that is very important because without your aim, that's then you don't even know what you're doing. And that means on the very basic level in sociocracy, right? You don't know what an objection is until you know what your aim is. Um, but even more generally, and that's actually the reason the dot is not sort of on the maximum is that I find that although we know that, I don't think we pay enough attention to it. Um, and I see that groups struggle when they are not clear about the aim, but they also struggle when they might be agreeing on the aim, but they're not fully aligned on the mission or the mission is not alive in people's minds, right? If it's stated somewhere, if a value statement is somewhere, mission statement is somewhere, but people aren't constantly reminded of it, then typically things start to fall apart a little bit. So that's just, it has bumped it up in priority for me of like, yes, we have to keep talking about our mission and keep talking about our aims so that that is something we all can uh, recite whenever we're asked so that it's really alive in our practice. Then fair distribution of cost and benefits. That is sort of something that we assume that if people make their own policy for themselves in a self-organized organization, that's what they would do. I also know that in the organization, that is in one sociocratic organization that I'm a part of, that is a hot topic all the time. What is fair? What is fair? What, you know, but that's, that's um, to expect it. And I think what it has done for me just to see it along the design principles is go like, you're right. That is not on the periphery, right? That's a core thing to pay attention to, although it's just on the policy level of things, how do you do it and so on. Um, but it is really something to pay attention to. And what I like here is one quote that stuck with me from my training with ProSocial so far, um, that this is about fairness is in the conversation, having the conversation. It's not so much in the outcome, right? It doesn't mean that everybody contributes the same number of volunteer hours, for example, in a volunteer organization. That's not the point. The point is that people have a sense that it makes sense the way it is. Then fair and inclusive decision-making, I don't have to talk about that because that is so obvious. I consider consent fair and inclusive and that's the end of that already. Let's talk about other things. Monitoring agreed upon behavior. I remember when I originally, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, actually, um, when I originally read about uh, Ostrom's principles, I think it was um, more talking about uh, no, that was graduated sanctions. That's in five. Never mind, I was wrong. But what I like about the monitoring agreed upon behavior and number five, graduated responses, is that um, it's basically including the feedback, right? So in feedback, in, in how did this work for me? And we do that all the time in sociocracy, right? But we also, and that's another topic that keeps coming up in sociocratic organizations, is the accountability question. What if people don't do what we agreed on? You know, what if they don't follow our policy? Like accountability is important. And here's another piece in how it's important. And that is that, again, what I learned sort of in, in the training is just paying attention to the fact that there will always be um, slight mismatches, little misunderstandings, people drop things, things fall through the cracks and nobody notices, right? Just little pieces of friction in the system. And we will have those all the time. And although sociocratic organization will be self-repairing to some extent, it, when things like that happen too often and people have a sense of that people are not accountable or are not following up and so on, the trust level goes down. And that is, um, that is something that we need to track. Paul, do you want to say it verbally? 
just just interrupt. Oh, sure. No, I'm just going to pick up. Um, just white rip going back to equity. This uh, core design principle number two there a little bit. I just wanted to share that I one of the things that I've learned is that equity is a funny thing. It's absolutely core to whether groups are working well. And at the same time, if you launch in with trying to talk about it, it seems to often backfire. And so I think this is where something like um, talking about is everybody's needs being met is a much more helpful way into this than is this fair. Um, I, it's interesting, isn't it, that they, we're identifying underlying principles here, but sometimes the language is not the language that you would use with a group if you're trying to work through these issues, if that makes sense. It, try introducing monitoring, for instance. <laughs> this is why I've tried to, I usually just talk about transparency now. Mm -hmm. Please go uh, ahead. Sorry. Yes, and one, one little add on, and you might know that about me, that I really like connecting frameworks and like mapping how frameworks go together. And for example, non-writing communication is right there and what you said, right? In that it doesn't make sense to give everybody the same, right? That's not how we need to understand it. It's a needs-based approach. So for, and that breaks down to very real things like salaries in an organization. They don't have to all be the same, but they have to make sense to the people. So that's and then they all they all tie in together right so if people are in um, included well in decisions they will also uh, buy into more the, the decisions that have been made so it all comes together fast and fair conflict resolution um that is not something that comes with sociocracy per se at least as soon as it's reached a, a level of escalation that can't be held in a circle anymore and and help from the parent circle or whatever. So that is something to pay attention to. Um, it, I think sociocracy to be really safe needs to be combined with some tools like that. And I always encourage, encourage every organization to have something like a conflict resolution circle so that that lives somewhere and the training around that lives somewhere because I think we all need it. Authority to self-govern is almost a no-brainer, but it's not so trivial. I mean, it looks very trivial at first. Sure, to self-govern, you have to be able to self-govern, but I mean, I'm sure many of you encounter that, but if, for example, the board is not on board with doing sociocracy, then things are really, really difficult. What if the founder is not on board, right? So, this is again not something on the periphery that's a key issue that comes up a lot and then the other one appropriate relations with other groups i didn't quite know what to do with that one but i know that in in the way sociocracy or so socratic circle method was thought up was that for example the board or the top circle mission circle call it whatever you want will be connected with other organizations and ideally we have this connection between sociocratic or cooperative or uh, like-minded organization that can support each other and learn from each other. So that's, and I just added it just by the visual. But that's, again, as I said, just my way of um, thinking through that for myself.